What's up, Tricket? Hey, boo. What kind of tea you drinking over? Jamacha green tea. <laughs> oh, Lord. It's got toasted rice and green tea and a dog hair in it, I just saw. Toasted rice? Mm-hmm. Never heard of putting rice in a tea. So good. Well, I'll tell you what. I'm a Ted Nugent fan. You're not hijacking our origin series with your foolishness. I'm no, I'm I'm one of I'm a Sturgill Simpson fan. He's so much cooler than Ted Nugent. I, ever I'm was. one of Ted Nugent's biggest fans now. I'm sure Ted would have you out to his ranch if you asked. Yeah, I think I'm gonna hit him up, man. I you know, I'm not a big Joe Rogan podcast listener. Our, our personalities just don't jive in a, in a lot of ways. You but, don't like that he cusses. Well, yeah. I, I mean, there's there are things about him that I don't agree with, and there's things about me that he would not agree with. That's okay. I think the dude is putting out over, from a secular standpoint, a good message, I think, for Americans to hear. So I'm glad he's doing what he's doing. Uh, but I don't listen to his podcast a lot until I saw that Ted came on. I followed Ted on Instagram half for a while. I always just thought Ted was this crazy rock and roll guy. I knew he liked to bow hunt. And when I listened to that show with him, it's really interesting. The first part, he goes through the, the kind of the history of rock and roll and the different styles of guitar and all this stuff, which is, is pretty cool. But then he gets into his uh i guess more his personal beliefs in terms of freedom and liberty and government and all this and son that joker came out hot and now i'm a ted nugent fan i even listened to i i've never let have you ever listened to ted nugent's music yeah you have that the song you played earlier in the gym and that you sent me i've been listening to that song for forever no kidding man Back when, I mean, when I used to hang out with George and Steven and all them, Ted Nugent, Ozzy Osbourne, like all the crazy rock guys, that was cool to listen to that. Yeah. Like you were cool. Well, I'll tell you, I, I like Ted's music. And I also, one of my favorites, though, as far as rock and roll goes, to watch perform is Stevie Ray Vaughan. His dang style is just, why are, why are off we, the chain why are we doing this i are, don't know are you trying to turn the origin series into your regular formatted podcast no where you no small talk and then you go into a i was just talking about what was on my mind today where where do we where are we picking up on the origin series you have the longest hair i've ever seen coming out of your nose <laughs> it's coming out of the left nostril pull it no you've got to get it for me later boo you got to at least put it back up in there i'm just going to stare at it the whole time okay that's as good as it gets. I so just to fill people in, I was I just pulled it up. Our last origin series came out on July twelfth. Like that is so sad. You want to tell people what the origin series is because we probably have a lot of new listeners that don't even know what it is. Yeah, that's a good idea. So the origin series was something Chad and I came up with, where we just wanted to tell our story, like completely raw, unfiltered. We don't sugarcoat we don't hide anything you get all the details of pretty much from the time we met and we're working our way up into the present but by gosh I mean if the last episode was recorded in July obviously we're on the struggle bus to finish this project but yeah it's so there's this will be the fifth um origin series wow really this yep I was just we were just listening to the or I was just listening to the end of part four trying to figure out where we left off and yeah, this this one will be part five. So Man. if you're listening to this and you don't know what we're talking about, go way back. And I probably, next episode, I should have their episode number for you guys. But you got to go way back and find the origin series part one. Why are we doing this? I want to do it because... This is, I don't think we've ever talked about this, but I know my answer right away. Like, I think people look at you and they look at us and the success you've had with 307. And it's so important to me that people know what it took to get here. Like, it's so important for me that people know that 
the struggles and the hard times and the people we used to be and what we've become and how God has decided to just give us this life, you know? What why do you why do you do it? What's why is it important to you? Well, I, you know, I I think really what because I don't I don't necessarily find my own story to be interesting because it's been my life you could have fooled me (laughs) well I mean the I talk about I tell my story and I do talk because that's the purpose of a podcast I think really what has uh drove me to continue with this is that maybe one day it will be cool for the younger generation of our family did you almost say our kids no, no. Like we Blake, I'm think I'm obviously thinking Blakely and JoJo. Okay. Maybe it'll and be Wendell. Yeah, and Wendell. It'll be cool for them to be able to hear like, oh, this is what Uncle Chad and Aunt Brooks' life was like. I think that's cool. And then also, I've had a lot of listeners tell me that they enjoy listening to the story. So I was just talking to Scott Worthington the other day and he he asked me, When are y'all gonna do another origin series and and um so obviously, if this show is for the listeners, it's not for me. And so, if, if they like it, then I'm going to put the work in. Uh, most especially for our Patreon members. Oh. I mean, we've got uh, over 200 people that that basically <clears throat> are the reason that the podcast even exists. Mm-hmm. They they provide um, the support that allows us to buy the equipment that allows us to take the time that allows us to do everything that we do. Um, and so for them, especially if the Patreon members get something out of anything in particularly, then that's kind of the way I want to go. But, um, yeah, man, it's, uh, the podcast is a labor of love. It really is because it takes the most time to do. And, it reaps the, by a long shot, the smallest financial reward, but the impact that it makes is, is really the reward that I get from it. Yeah. And so I'm thankful that there are people out there that are willing to donate their money on a monthly basis to keep this thing up and going so that, you know, we can push out hopefully an impactful message or story or principle to thousands of people. Uh, we're over, we're well over a million downloads now. I know we we are. I don't know if I'm allowed to spill the beans, but like, I I was talking to Chad last week, and it's like they're hiring some new people, and the team is growing. And I looked at, pay, I was looking at Podbean, and it said one point one. It says more than that now, one point one million plays. That's what it is, right? Yeah, the little play button and. There was something else we were talking about, and I was just like, holy crap. This yeah. This is a company you started two years ago just for fun. Like, you didn't even know what it was going to turn into, you know? No. The, you know the reason I started a podcast? We talked about the reason we start, started the Origin Series. The reason I started a podcast is because I cut grass for a summer after I got out of the SEAL teams, and during that summer on my lawnmower cutting grass, I would listen to podcasts. That's the first time in the history of my life that I had ever listened to podcasts, and I really enjoyed it. Um, and so that's what attracted me to the 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 media source of a podcast, and that's the reason I started it, is to provide value in a form that I enjoyed consuming information and content. And, Lord, yeah, we never expected to get have over a million downloads i mean that's freaking crazy man it's insane yeah it is so on that topic before we move forward patreon thank you you guys that maybe you're not in a financial situation uh, place where you can contribute to the podcast um will you please at least help us put the word out on the show if there's some part of the show that um sparks your interest or or maybe um provokes thought uh continue the conversation with people that you love pass the word to people that it might help and um share the show on social media if you don't mind that is one thing that 
I don't want to say it bothers me, but I see every episode we put out, thousands and thousands of people consume the show, and it'll get shared by the same five or six people online every time. And it's like that's a really small price. To, I'm guilty of that. Too. That's a really small price to pay. If you get if you don't get anything from the show, obviously that's different. But if you do, that's a really small thing. I'm just asking you if you can do that at a minimum. And you don't have to share it. A lot of you guys aren't on social media, and that's cool. I don't freaking blame you. Uh, and so I probably there's no way that I can see the person to person interaction uh, as the show grows and gets passed around. And that is even more impactful. Sometimes if you, you know, you tell somebody, Hey, yeah. you know, so or, I appreciate that or comment or like, or write a review. Yeah. 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 Did yeah. you write a review or do any of the stuff you just said on Joe Rogan's podcast with Ted Nugent to help him out? So the podcasts that I listen to regularly, I have reviewed them. Um, practice what you preach, right? Yeah. Yeah. You're the, doing it. Yeah. yeah the podcast. Uh, and I do that on Apple and and um, some of the shows that, that are impactful to me, I will share. I know Sean Ryan just did a show with uh, DJ Shipley, I think is his name, a former SEAL operator that was really, really powerful. And I shared that. And yep. So, yeah, I mean, de- definitely I, I try to do the same exact thing. So. You do. Thank you, boo-boo. Thank you for holding me accountable for that. <laughs> My accountability, buddy. You better, go, uh, you better go write a review on that episode with Joe and Ted. Yeah, I've I've actually thought about commenting on that and sh- sharing that. I, I probably will. Um, really cool show, but anyways, so where do we where are we picking up, Boo Boo? So we ended the last episode. I honestly, I'm gonna fly by the seat of my pants because I only listened to like the last five minutes, and we had got on a topic of talking about Jada and how Jada saved me twice. Mm-hmm. And it got emotional and it got deep. I'm 90% sure, excuse me, right before that, I talked about how on my birthday, we sat down on the beach. We walked to the beach like we always did. And we were coming right outside of that little walkway, sat down, and I told you that I needed help. That I had a drug problem and I I wanted to be better and I wanted to do something. Mm Mm-hmm. And to my knowledge, that's where we left off. Oh, okay. I don't know if you remember. No, that sounds about right to me. Because I don't remember talking about anything about rehab or the process or any. Yeah, well, I remember that too. Chicks Beach used to drag me out there all the time. That was your spot. Loved it. We lived right maybe a half mile from the beach there. We could just walk down to it. Really cool place. And. Yeah, I remember that day too, and that was that was a huge turning point in our life. That was the first time you had ever openly admitted what you were going through. I think that I had some intuition, mm-hmm. but um, that you was the first. Evidence. Yeah, the first time you came out and said, "Man, I got, uh, I'm ready to to uh, at least attempt to get better," and but we didn't know what to do once you decided you were ready to get better. It was, it was difficult as far as I can remember. I mean, it was even like so desperate as to like back then they were running commercials. I think on like, um, if you are ready to get sober, call this number and we'll help you get And Like we were, of course we didn't know freaking where to turn. Mm -mm. And, the Navy had the Navy may have had some resources or some 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 programs at Portsmouth and but man, I'm gonna go ahead and tell you anything that the government runs is subpar. Anything they do is subpar. So I don't even think we were really much considering that unless than it was a last ditch effort. So how did we end up finding the Farley Center? That wasn't until later. Um, oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, that didn't, Williamsburg place was the rehab I went to, but that wasn't, I mean, that was from the moment we're <laughs> talking about, that was probably a few months. That's true, man. That's so crazy. Cause yeah. I forgot all about that. We just thought, or I just thought that you could just 
go into like a um a detox a little detox center and, and it, be it, out for four or five days it was a mental hospital a psychiatric hospital and yes that was that was what we decided we were going to do was i was going to get dropped off go through all my withdrawals and i was going to come out all peachy and happy and back to normal yeah that uh-huh. was what we thought boy that was real freaking stupid yep i can't believe how ignorant we were I mean, I mean, if you've never had any experience in addiction and drugs, what? How? I mean, what are you supposed to learn? You know, like yeah. But yeah, you dropped me off. Do you remember? I was like vegan, plant based at that time, being like all crazy about it. And do you remember? You still are. Yeah, but do you remember dropping me off? You went. You dropped me off at detox. Maybe you left me. I I just remember you went to Whole Foods and grocery shopped for me, so I wouldn't have to eat the oh, cafeteria man. food at the mental hospital. How do you remember that? That's so crazy. Because it was so sweet, and I was so proud that like my I was in there. I I was an f up just like everybody else, and here my husband was taking his time to go grocery shopping to bring me food, so I didn't have to eat the decent cafeteria food. I was so proud it's just funny that is that is funny that you remember that you don't remember that well i do now that you mention it yeah yeah i remember bringing bags of groceries up there for you yeah um and around this same time in in my professional life in the navy uh once we once we decided we were going to embark on this mission to um, get get Brooke better. She decided that for herself, <clears throat> and I decided I was going to support her. I had to go to my command master chief and basically just say, "Hey, this is what's going on in my personal life. I gotta, <clears throat> I gotta find, I gotta get out of the platoon for a little while so that she can, I can support her through this." And they ac- he accommodated that request, but. Was he not the one who was also a former addict? Was that a different command? Yeah, yeah, no, nah, yeah, he wasn't. Um, I remember someone else that you had to confide in was like, I'm in recovery too. Yeah, if no, not. that wasn't the command master chief. The command master chief at the time, I can picture him in my head. I don't even remember his name, but he was just kind of a freaking butthole. <laughs> yeah i mean he he was just like oh well you know what the crap man and but ultimately i'm not gonna talk too much crap about him because he let you yeah they accommodated and i got uh i, I was able to move over to be an instructor and as an instructor well doing working in the the training cell that i got placed in which was land warfare we weren't deploying, but we were still traveling a lot. So the only good part was is that at least I had, you know, steady cell phone communications. I wasn't gone six months at a time. I was gone just weeks at a time, back to back usually with a few days in between. But it helped anyways. You started land warfare way before I went into detox. That was that We talked about that in the last episode. That was one of the things that... I feel like pushed me to my edge was the schedule with you going out to Chaffee. Yeah. Yeah. Like that four weeks gone, one week back. Mm-hmm. We had talked about that. Yeah. Well, I, I, well, I remember going and having that conversation with him and that's the reason I went to land warfare. May, maybe that, I don't remember exactly when that happened, but maybe it was when I knew something bad was going on yeah and uh so so maybe that's what it was but that was the purpose of it and um so yeah the detox thing that didn't work how many times you go in there (laughs) two well let me tell them i mean like you dropped me off i'm gonna grab something real quick keep talking um i went and the first day i felt fine of course when you get there like you, they take everything from you and you put on their clothes and you can't smuggle drugs in. So I had nothing. And I knew I was going to have to detox. And I had detoxed a few times when I couldn't get pills, but never for more than like two days. And 
So when it begun, if you don't know what withdrawals are like, it starts out with you feeling really tired and your body starts aching and your nose and eyes start running. And that just all of that intensifies into a lot of stomach cramps, terrible diarrhea, your blood pressure drops. Um, you just feel like dizzy, lightheaded. You feel like you have the flu times about a thousand. And then there's nausea and you just feel really cold. It just sucks. So I think I went through two, I don't remember, maybe two, three days of that. And I decided I couldn't do it. I thought after one or two days, it would let up and then I would be better. (laughs) And when I realized that I was just beginning to be into the thick of it after two, three days, I made a plan I knew I had a prescription um, that I hadn't filled somewhere, and I was like, I'm going to get out. I'm going to get that prescription. I'm going to taper myself down so I don't have to feel like this, and it's going to be fine. And so I remember I got out. I called you to come get me, and you were real apprehensive. You were like, oh, are you sure this is? Did you ask them? Like, what? And I I forgot what I said to manipulate you, just that, like, I wasn't comfortable there. I'm sure I said something that, like, made you concerned. That way you would come get me. And you came and got me, and I went and picked up that prescription. And then me and you went through this thing where, like, I told you all my tricks, and I should, like, just a ways that I couldn't take more than I was supposed to on this taper. You were a real trickster back then. Oh, I was a freaking trickster. <laughs> Holy crap. I can remember right now some of the things I Dang would do. Genius. Like take like I would take and like buy similar size and colored pills. Like melatonin was one of them and put it in the pill bottle that way like I could take extra and when you just glanced in the bottle it would look like they were all still there. Yeah. And do you do you remember any of that? Like picking me up from detox and like me saying Uh I really it's not vivid to me, no. It's crazy, man. I, I think I think I have a I have a very strange mind and it tends to block things out that aren't good. And most of my life up and I mean, up until here recently, has been filled with not good stuff. <laughs> so I don't remember much, but so I don't have vivid memory of it. Just general, you know. Do you remember? Do you remember in that moment realizing I was taking extra and lying to you? And do you remember me sitting on the porch there at the little house off Pleasure House and just sh- screaming at me? And, like, telling me that you were going to send me back to my parents so they could deal with it. And do you remember that? No, uh-uh. that's that, probably about when I was ready to quit on you, though. That was the only time you ever really lost your cool. Like, you lost your cool a little bit a few times, but, like, and I can see why. Well, I, it doesn't feel good when you re- when you are he- when you are working through the process of realizing that you are completely helpless. Yeah. And I've lied. I, I mean, I would lie. I think in that moment you realize I had lied to you so many times and I was lying to you again. And you're probably just like, what the heck? And I had not come to the realization also that I was dealing with someone who was sick. Like my wife was sick. I just thought it was you were just being a bad person. Yeah. You know what I mean? And when, when we say sick, that's an interesting thing that I think a lot of people can't wrap their minds around because... You know, addiction is this weird thing, and and when you talk about you're sick, the person is sick. They they truly are. It's a, however you want to describe it, it it is a side effect of these drugs. I mean, that I think that's the one thing people can't get over with um with addiction is they say, well, it all started with a choice, the person's choice. Well, that's not that's not necessarily true. Um, these 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 decisions might start with a a prescription mm-hmm. that p- 
people receive because of an operation or or whatever it may be. Yeah. Like, what, I can't believe we haven't talked about this. We were watching a Netflix documentary about ADHD medication. And, like, I'm pretty sure that's what led to my addiction was I was told from a really young age, you need this Ritalin, Adderall, Vyvanse. You need this medication to function and mm-hmm. be a productive human. Mm-hmm. So take your pill every morning. Don't forget it. And, like, you can't tell me that doesn't set a kid up to believe that they're reliant on medication to function properly. Like, that that was my parents' choice and my teacher's. And my doctor, you know, yeah, that yeah. wasn't my choice as a kid. I hated that stuff. Yeah, it, it is truly um, a illness that is is a chronic illness that's produced by this freaking epidemic of medicine. I, I, I saw a thing on Instagram the other day. This guy, he's a some big Instagram head. I don't even remember which one it was. There's a bunch of these big Instagram heads. But he was uh, he was walking down a sidewalk somewhere in L.A. or something, and there was this group of homeless people, and one of them was he was doing drugs there on the sidewalk, and the Instagram head he just thought it was it was funny to as he records this conversation where he's essentially putting this homeless guy down for doing these drugs on the sidewalk, and like, hey man, don't you know drugs are bad for you? Like, you you shouldn't be. And I'm like, dude, are you realize how freaking stupid you look right now? Like. Do you realize the conversation you're having with this poor homeless dude that has probably been living with this disease of addiction for no telling how long? You don't know how that started for him, man. Right. You don't know what that dude's going through. And do you think that you telling him that drugs are bad for you is going to to uh, resolve his, his illness? Make it worse. You're just a freaking idiot, man. I, it pissed me off so bad. You should have commented that. Yeah, I, I, you know, man, there, there's just, there, you know, there's a bunch of people on Instagram that have a ton of followers, so many more than me, and and all they're doing is capitalizing off of people's emotions. That's all they're doing. They post crap, whether it's a, a, a political about a political issue or social issue like drug use, and they're just pandering to people's emotions. That's what that dude was doing. You know all the all the the conservative Christians that that probably follow him Christians in quotation marks probably said yeah you should tell that sorry homeless drug addict that what he's doing is wrong they're just pandering to that didn't and didn't it, try to help him. it makes me freaking sick man I should yeah and these these other guys that 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 want to pander to these right wing political agendas to sell their T shirt you know. I'm sorry. Chill. I'm getting off of that. Do right though. I mean, not to not to like fuel your rabbit hole, but shame perpetuates addiction more than anything. So if whatever you're doing is shaming someone you're wanting to help get out of addiction, it's just gonna make it worse. Man, that's a good point, baby. That's a good point. Like Yeah. And and you know, hey man. A lot of y'all listening to this probably say, well, Chad, why, why do you follow these people? Well, I'm on social media. Like, it's a big part of my, it's a big part of the way I get the message out. I like to to follow people and just see the climate of, or the climate of what's happening on there. And, yeah, I think I probably stopped following that, that particular dude. But anyways, uh, to answer your question, that's why I'm on there. It Social media can be a great tool, Okay. I'm not saying don't use it. You have to use it responsibly, though, because <clears throat> there's a bunch of freaking bull crap on there. So we, you know, I wasn't treating you like I had no understanding that this wasn't just something that I could talk you out of. Right. You thought, all right, I'm going to get real with her for a second and maybe it'll wake her up. Yeah. You, I remember I was sitting on the step. And you were standing in front of me and you were pacing back and forth and you had your your phone in your hand and you had the pill bottle in the other hand. And you, I don't remember what you were saying, something about me lying to you and do you want to get better? Do you want to do this? And then you started threatening to send me back home. I don't remember if, what you were saying, but I just remember like, I think you called my dad in front of me. I, yeah, you did. You called my dad. 
and you were like, I don't know if I can do this anymore. And I remember hearing my dad's voice. It was really shaky. And he was like, he was like, we'll, we'll take care of her. Just send her home. Yeah. You know? Well, that would have been a disaster. No, we're not going to go there. <laughs> I mean, it would have put me back in where I know all of my dealers and where I have unlimited access to drugs. Like, yeah, yeah. That would have been. Yeah. Well, luckily, eventually, at some point, Blake talked me out of that and talked some sense into me and made me realize that, man, Chad, that's not the way to be acting as a husband and the leader of your family. Sorry that you're going through what you're going through, man, but you're going to have to freaking man up <laughs> and take it, son. But just to kind of, like, drive home what you were going through, we're talking, like, back, this, this where we're at right now is, like, 2014. You go back to 2007, 2008 was probably the first couple signs that I had a drug problem that Chad was slapped in the face with, and I lied. And then you fast forward a few more years, there was something else that happened where drugs come up missing, or I, like, when you pulled that drug out of my wallet when I was in the ER, and, like, every time, every few years, there would be this big thing where you would have this, like oh my gosh, she's a drug addict. And I would lie my way out of it. Mm -hmm. And then here we are, you know, and, and finally, years and years later, I'm trying to get help and I'm still lying. And I'm telling you, I want to get better. I want, I want to do this. But then I'm turning around and manipulating you and everybody. Well, that makes sense so, to me now. <laughs> it didn't make sense to me back then. Yeah. But I'm just saying it would have been... I don't, I've always thought, and I'll ever, like, any time I think about it, I just, I'm so grateful for you. I don't know if I could have done what you did. Like, if I was on the other side, I don't, yeah. I don't know if I could have. Well, that's by the grace of God. I mean, luckily, once, once, once we're now are up to the point in our story that we are now, I had my faith in Jesus. Like, I had, I had that to, to really, as a foundation, and, that's the only way I, I was able to make it through it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I say that from the bottom of my heart. I'm not trying to sound like some, um, you know, whatever, whatever you take that as. I mean, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. If it wasn't for that being a part of my life, um, I don't think that I would have made it through my own power. Just because, you know, and like I said, if if that, if I was, if I had to deal with a family member now that was an addict, and that same thing happened, I would just be like, well, well, yeah, of course they, of course they did that. That's 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 normal. That's how they act, you know. And we just got to bear with them through the process. Yeah. So I've come a long ways, man. <laughs> I'll forever be in debt to Blake too about what you said. Just to reiterate that, like everybody, including my family, was telling you, I don't blame you one bit. Yeah. If you walk away from this marriage, like I totally understand you're at the peak of your career. You worked really hard and you went through a lot to get to where you are in the teams. And this is holding you back. Like, I don't blame you. And Blake was the only one. Blake's the best of all of us. He's the best of the whole bunch. I, I said that the other day and I think some people in, in the family might take offense to that. But I'm, I mean, that's the reality of it. He, he is the most steady force. He is the most kind. Faithful. Faithful. Genuinely loving. And of the whole lot of the family, he's the best. Most consistent. And he has his flaws, like we all do. Just so y'all don't think that, that we worship Blake. <laughs> <laughs> But the reality of it is, is no, he, he really is. You're right. And the consistency, like you said, the consistency is key. He's, he's always been like that. As long as I can remember, he's trusted Jesus and he's just, he just means what he says and mm -hmm. he'll help you. Yep. But so going from there, and I bet I'm excited to say this because I think you're going to be like, whoa. So I got back. I don't really remember what happened between the time when I was sitting on the porch, you were yelling at me. I think I told you I was sober. 
I'm pretty like, no, I know that's right. So I told you, okay, fine. I got this. I have it under control. I was driving all the way to Norfolk to get drugs from, I don't remember. I was hiding it. I was still using. You and me were looking for a house during this time to oh, move yeah. out Good of Chick's gosh. Beach. What a freaking nut roll that was. It was a disaster. Like, I was nodding out in the car. It was really, really bad. And you you can you can talk about any of that if you want. If not, I'm going to jump to we bought a house. And your mom and dad had came up to help us move in. And Doyle and his wife. Oh. I can't remember Doyle's wife's name. Okay. Well, they came over for dinner. We had just moved into this new house. And your parents had came over, and your dad takes a lot of medication. And I knew that. And they knew I had just went to detox. They knew I was newly clean. They did, they're they like you. They're ignorant. They didn't know. So they left um, some really strong pain pills out in the open. And I took them. Like, I stole most of them, immediately took a ton, and um, they immediately knew. And I remember I remember that so vividly. Like, we were all sitting around on the couch. We had just got done with dinner. Your mom realized it, and she asked me to come outside. And she was so kind and loving and patient and just, like, was like, you need to give them back to me. I'm worried about you. Give them back. So I gave her back what I had. Maybe I, I probably didn't, actually. I probably lied to her. Um, and your dad came out, and they were just, they were heartbroken. Mm -hmm. But they weren't mad at me, you know? And um, I remember your dad telling Doyle and them they probably needed to leave. And I don't, I'm trying to think what all went on that night. Like, I don't remember your reaction I just remember feeling like a huge failure because I had you thinking that I was okay. And then I slipped up, you know? Yeah, yeah. And now... I remember that was a... Yeah, I mean, that was a very somber evening. It definitely ruined our our little gathering we had there. And celebrating our new house. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. You know, it's... Uh, it's... Man... That just to me goes to show the power of addiction, and you're you're in this circumstance. You're you are not thinking with a logical human mind while you're t while you're taking these drugs, stealing these drugs. You have to know that somebody's going to notice. Oh yeah, but you can't stop yourself. That is powerful, man. No, and that was my story a million different times. I knew I was going to get caught. I knew someone was going to know, but I couldn't. I mean, you can't just, stop yourself. If it's there and it's available, that's it. That's that's the that's the symptom of the disease aspect we're talking about. Yeah, right. you can't look at this, and that's what's so crazy. That that's what you know. I think there are a lot of a lot of things that you deal with from your past that you haven't reconciled with. And it, it, I, I get that, man. But you know, I just have to say, you've, at some point, you got to set your yourself free from that because that was not you. No matter what you did, no matter what the the whatever you did, that was not you. You know, and yeah, that's your journey. Yeah. But just me, from for looking from the outside, I'm able to laugh about it. Even if it's something just horrific, stupid, detrimental, evil, I just laugh at it because I'm like, well, there that that's um that is a representation of the power of these freaking drugs, and that's all it is. And I, in my in my head, from the outside, I can separate the two. You know what I mean? But internally, I know that's difficult. I'm still struggling with things from my past that are difficult. We just identified one the other day. I mean. We can talk about it in a little bit. Yeah. If you want. But no, I, to your point, I am able to 
not hold on to the things I did to myself and like the situations I put myself in where I put myself at risk and bad things happened to me because of the situations I was putting myself in that like no one will ever know and I have to live with but I'm some weird way I'm okay with those it's the ones where I stole from people and I hurt people Mm -hmm. that I love like my family and your family Mm -hmm. those are the ones that suck oh yeah yeah well that is what everyone I think that's what that that's what drives everyone or a lot of people to the need for forgiveness is the fact that you can forgive other people but you it's hard almost impossible to forgive yourself you need someone else to forgive you everybody deals with that man yeah i'm this uh, yeah. yeah so you know that's a that's a that's really a great asset um, in terms of showing you or making you realize, dang, what Jesus did was abs- absolutely necessary. <laughs> like, that was necessary because I can't forgive myself. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Anyways. And, and just to put it out there, your family and my family have both said to me, they forgive me. Yeah. Well, there go. I mean, there again, that's, that's much easier to forgive someone else than for you to forgive yourself. It's like, we all go through that. I mean, we can, we can, we could identify in every single person that's in our lives. We could, we can see that playing out the fact that they, they are able to forgive others, but not themselves. Yeah, definitely. But so that next morning, if you don't remember anything else from that night, I mean, that next morning, me and you decided that we were going to go, I was going to go back to detox and I wasn't leaving this time. Like I was going to ride it out and just endure the pain. And it was what it was, you know, like, and I remember we went and walked at the Great Dismal Swamp right before you went to drop me off. Me and you took the girls down the ditch. And then... Hard times, boy. Yeah. And then from there, it still hurt really bad. I still got really sick. Um, it, it just wasn't good. And I think I was there for five days. And then the, the detox is actually the people that talked me into going to rehab. Yeah. And I remember that I was thinking I didn't want to. And I talked to you on the phone, and you were like, I think you should. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, because I didn't want to. You didn't want to be away from Jada. You didn't. You. I mean, I was. And, gosh, the emotions, like, when you initially get sober, and this is why so many people relapse. Is because when you initially get sober and you go from using for, I think for me it was close to seven or eight years, to bam, you're sober, everything you've ever done comes back. And it's just there. It's just waiting. Mm. And for me, I didn't have any coping skills. I didn't have any tools in my box, you know. So I'm sitting here with this weight, and all I wanted to do is be around you. You I mean, didn't have fitness. You didn't have nothing. 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 Photography. Nothing. No. And I had all this shame that just felt like I was being crushed. I mean, so they talked me into going to rehab, and we had the most amazing insurance through Tricare. So I was able to go to a rehab called Williamsburg Place, and it was actually the Farley Center. It was for professionals. Mm-hmm. It was for, like, lawyers, nurses, doctors, people that had to answer to a board to get their job back. And granted, it was separated into two different things. I wasn't with the professionals the whole time, but the rehab itself was just freaking fantastic. I mean... Yeah, it was, in a, it was a nice place, it, it looked was. like, for me. But It was really nice. And I remember being there and just... 
I don't know. Like, I have good memories from there. The f- I was there for 28 days, and I remember the first two weeks, my body felt so <laughs> horrible. I remember, like, we used to have to do these therapy sessions as a group. We had our group we would meet with every day. And I kept begging to lay down during the therapy session <laughs> because it hurt so bad to sit in a chair like, cause when you take, okay, so when you take pain pills for a really long time and you stop, not only do you have the flu like aches, but if you have any pain, it's like intensified. Like right now I wouldn't feel any of the pain that I was feeling then. Like my back hurt, my joints hurt, my neck hurt. Like, and it's just because you don't have any, any good dopamine, anything left to ease any kind of pain in your body left in your brain is all gone. Mm -hmm. and that's crazy I just remember hurting so bad and not sleeping but one of the things I do remember and I I never forget is we were staying in these little apartments and I brought my bible with me and every night I would stick my finger into my bible and whatever page it came up on I would read that chapter yeah and the first night I stuck my finger in the Bible and it opened up and it was that chapter that starts out like, woe is sorrow, woe is grief, woe is something with bloodshot eyes. And it's a reference to seeking fermented wine and it was a reference to addiction. Mm -hmm. And I think it's one of the only major references to addiction in the Bible. And I was just like, I don't remember if if that hit me. I remember thinking, like, this is really freaking weird. Yeah, the Bible's a big book. Yeah, really big. That sticks out. You came to visit me. Oh, I remember my visits. Uh, My visits were so awkward. Oh. I I got to come, like, what, once a week or something? Um, After, you didn't get to come for the first two weeks, but then after I graduated the initial thing you came to like family day yeah yeah and it was a very controlled environment and there were other people around and I was so I was just so awkward because I'm thrust into this thing and I still don't quite understand I'm learning finally just little bits of what's actually happening and you know if I if I have to share in the group I'm like trying to motivate the group and tell them they can do it and there's good life outside of here and and every, and Brooke and all of her um uh, what do you call them I, I want to call them classmates <laughs> all <of> her, <laughs> I mean pretty much all of her classmates are just like rolling their eyes at me like come on dude you don't freaking know nothing and uh of course back even back then I was still really cocky and mm-hmm. just oh that was so funny man. do you remember when you came to the family day where I like jumped up and like pushed through my chair down on the ground and walked out no uh -uh. thank hard you really don't remember that no we were sitting in a semi-circle in that little cafeteria area talking and it was spouses and the addict and we were talking about something and you brought up that i had faked an illness and brought up the fact that i had had elective surgery just to cover up the fact that I was an addict. And, like, the way you were saying it, you were just trying to drive home, like, how sick I was. You weren't trying to be mean. Mm -hmm. But I just remember, like, I couldn't handle that. Like, I couldn't handle hearing that. I can't believe you don't remember this. Mm -mm. And I remember I just jumped up and pushed my chair down, like, just like a little kid, and ran out of the room. (laughs) Left. Wow. Left. No, I don't my my. I can't believe you don't remember that. My traumatized, warped mind blocked that out. Nope. Wow, man. Hard time, son. I also remember sitting in that booth with you when we had our alone time and you telling me that you were not going to quit going to Fort Chaffee and I was not going to take that from you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because I love teaching land warfare. Yeah, you loved that at, it, just because you and uh, Jeff used to go out there and hunt. That's all y'all did. Well, yeah, it was like man camp. Yeah. you All you did was hunt, blow stuff up, and shoot freaking machine guns. Remember how many sheds y'all used to find out there? Oh, yeah. It was off the chain, man. So you were you were setting your boundaries right there. You were like, I'm glad you're getting better, but look here, woman. You're not going to stop my life. Like, 
Yeah. Yeah, you 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 got you didn't like that. <laughs> but it, well, even when you came out of um I don't know if you want to say anything else about what you what you learned in rehab or what was impactful to you, but it wasn't it wasn't game over after you came out. You mm-hmm. still struggled with a dr- with drug abuse mm-hmm. when you got out. Yeah, because they prescribed um a drug called gabapentin or neurotin and it was it was to combat what i was talking about a minute ago how like the pain in your body is so intensified because of what i had been using so they gave me that and an ssri and i f- of course found out that if i took a ton of that neurotin or gabapentin i could feel not high but like i didn't feel any pain like, I figured out a way to abuse it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that was when I left rehab, I went to a, oh, what was it called? A relapse prevention intensive therapy once yeah. a week with a big group that was also free, freshly sober. And I remember, like, every week I would come in and I never lied about it. At this point, I quit lying. I quit lying to you. I, and I think that was a big turning point. I quit lying to you. I wasn't lying to the people at therapy. I'd be like, yeah, I took too much of my neurotin this week. And like, I would have to Hmm. start my number over and I was back at zero, like trying to accrue days sober. And I just couldn't, I couldn't get more than 30 days. I would abuse something. And it, I mean, it didn't have to be a narcotic. If you went with the intent of getting high, you relapsed. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, like. How in the world did you finally stop? I'll tell you. So I had been sober for a few months and you were gone. And I decided that I could go home on my own. I was not taking the neurotin anymore. That I, well, maybe I was, but I wasn't using narcotics. If I was abusing the neurotin, that was what it was. I decided I was going to go home on my own. I could handle it. I'd had enough time sober, maybe a month or two. Oh, yeah, I remember that. And I went home, and somebody who was close to me who always gave me drugs just was there, popped back up in my life, and um, I took them. And then I ended up stealing from that person when I left Georgia. Mm Mm-hmm. And on the drive home, I was coming down 58 through Emporia and me and the girls were in the car and I took the last pill that I had stolen from that person. And I just, something about that moment, I was like, I, it just hit me what I had done stealing from them. And I was like, I don't, I'm done. Like, this is it. This is over. And that was the last (laughs) That was the last pill I took. Dang. I don't know why. Why it took that moment. Like, there wasn't anything significant. Delilah was on the radio. Man. That is wild. Yep. What, you know, well, of course, you, you continued to seek treatment through NA meetings and mm-hmm. and all this stuff for a for a long long time. Um, I went to some of them with you, and oh, that was kind of awkward too. <laughs> <laughs> there, those are the weirdest uh, things. So I don't know strange. how much we can talk about it on the podcast because I know it's a very private community. But I mean, they're as always as don't say names. It's they're fine. always in the weirdest places, yeah. and it's like. Uh, it's a you have to recite all the things like yeah. the whole group recites things. You and, know, thank God for those programs, man. Hmm. I mean, I don't know if you remember, but I was doing this thing called ninety and ninety, and it was you do ninety meetings in ninety days, and the purpose is to get to know a group of people and just kind of be held accountable. And they're all addicts, so they know your games. They know, they know your manipulation. Like you just can't, you can't get around it. And I remember in our area, 
the only meetings that were close were all really country black people. Yeah. Like the entire meeting, there was no white people. And I just embraced it. I was like, yeah. you know what? And they loved me so much. Mm-hmm. Like, and they, they were what I needed then. You know what I mean? They were real with me. They were sweet to me. They took care of me. And do you remember the first meeting we went to? You came with me. It was at Obesey Hospital. And I'm not going to say the name, but you would laugh if I said it. Really big old black guy that was in a wheelchair and it was his birthday. I remember his name. I do do too. (laughs) Don't say it. But yeah, you're right. It was, it was just. I don't know. It's so hard to think about those days and like where my head was at. But I also, we didn't tell to back up right when I got out of rehab. The next day, okay, so when I was getting ready to leave rehab, Chad started telling me on the phone that he had a surprise for me when I got home. And granted, again, I had stayed like two nights in my brand new house. And yeah. we went we went from a 400 square foot house to a 2,000 square foot house with an acre. So this was a big deal. Mm -hmm. I mean, and so Chad kept telling me he had a surprise. He had a surprise. And I was telling all my friends at rehab, like, I bet you he got me a pig. I bet you he got me. And we were just guessing. And then we went out to dinner the, the, the next. I got home that evening. The next day he took me out to a Mises Pizza. May have been, probably, if we were eating pizza. Yeah, and we ran into who was going to be skydiving with me the next day. They were eating dinner. Mm. Who? Harley? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, they started talking about skydiving, and you spilled the beans. You had set up a skydive for me that Mm. next day. Do you remember that? Yeah, vaguely. That was my surprise. Yep. Uh, I well, one thing that I really remember from that time is when when you first uh, you had this old beach cruiser bike and we we went out and I, uh, to ride bikes or something and I just remember how like weak you were physically like you couldn't you could ride your bike like a mile on a flat trail and you would just be completely exhausted. And I also remember, I don't know how impactful it was in your mind, but I also remember like you having to come to terms with this, this, this new view you had, this is, this was reality. And like, I think it seemed really dull to you and just not exciting. And like, why is this, why is this so just blah? And I, I just, I remember, I think one time telling you like, this is what life is like. Like it's not every day. It's every day is not some big, exciting roller coaster ride. It's just, this is what regular life is like. And you having to just kind of come to terms with that and work through it. Mm-hmm. But well, and a lot of that too was where my brain was at. My brain and my body were in the dumps yeah. and needed a long time to heal. So like the way I used to describe it is you could have walked up and handed me like a winning lottery ticket and I wouldn't have felt anything. Mm -mm. And like, I wasn't able to really feel sad very well either. It was this weird flat line, no emotion. I felt stuck. It was terrible feeling Mm -hmm. terrible. And I had no idea how long that was going to last. Like the therapists and stuff that I was working with said, you know, this is normal. Like, it's going to get better, but nobody could tell me when. Mm -hmm. And that was into that story where, like, I wanted to drive my car off the road into the tree. Yeah. To either die or get badly hurt and get pain medicine and, like, be free of that feeling. Yeah. When Jada was in the car. But, no, you're right. I remember that conversation with you. Like, just, I don't know. Just remember... I don't. I don't think I believed y'all. I don't know what kept me hanging in there. Mm-hmm. Well, then you not long after you found C Fit. Yeah. Well, the the first introduction to exercise was that two mile run me and you did. 
at the Washington Ditch at the Great Dismal Swamp. Mm -hmm. And I remember how badly that hurt. We were talking about that on the podcast. Oh, yeah. It was terrible. Like it killed you. It did like to kill me. Yeah. And then I found a great gym and I was still smoking then. Yeah. I hadn't quit smoking yet. Yeah. But yeah, I'm getting in the weeds. I'm just having memory lane and like giving a bunch of really boring details that don't well add to the story. I think it I think it needs to be said in terms of this topic, this spe- this specific struggle that you had, how how long this recovery process actually is. Uh and and in all reality, it's a lifelong journey. But here just recently, this is the first time that you've been completely off of any medicine. Yeah, because I went in 2014, they put me on an SSRI, and we can we can go to that part of the story. I got off of it, started going back to college, and then had like a mental breakdown. I was sober. But I had a mental breakdown, and they put me back on an SSRI. And just last month, I got completely off of it. <laughs> That's a long journey. Yeah, it is a long. You're journey. talking years and years and years. Yeah. And now you're not. You know, you're you're. You, you weren't abusing this SSRI. You you no, were you, taking I mean, it as can't. as prescribed. Yeah. But it was it was maybe necessary to. To just help you through that that process, yeah. I mean, yeah. I remember the first time you had this. Um, they call it a panic attack. Wait, you're just hold on, hold on. Well, that was the thing at Regent. Yeah, wasn't? but but hold on. So I got out of rehab, and then it was what like six months before I decided I wanted to go back to school. Probably. Did anything happen? We had bought the new house. You were still at Chaffee, right? Probably. Land warfare. I feel like we're missing something big. No, I can't. I can't think anything big. Okay. Well, then, short to lead into what he's about to say, I got all motivated about life when I started to feel a little bit better because I quit smoking, I got a good gym, and I started eating healthy, and my body started to recover, and so did my mind. So I quit taking all the medications the rehab gave me. I was feeling fantastic and started going to Regent University for psychology. And then you want to tell what you were going to say? Well, I think, too, though, I think I I saw in you over the course of a few years after you got better, I saw in you almost the desire to prove yourself. I don't know if I think it's different than being motivated about life. I, it was almost like you wanted to prove that you could be a contributor. Well, like yeah. you wanted to prove that you could actually do something. Because up until this point, professionally, you had always worked, but it was always just you know waitressing or you know kind of little random weird side jobs and stuff. Yeah. Um. So I think you you really felt the need to be like, okay, I want to prove myself that that I can do something and be a contributor to not just to our family but to society. Yeah. You know? And so I think maybe that was driving you to go to school um and you seemed to be enjoying it. I loved it. Yeah. Like I was taking these Regents a Christian school, so I was taking, like, I remember the first semester I took um, survey of the New Testament, and, like, my faith grew in huge ways while I was there, just being surrounded by a bunch of people who believed. It, I mean, you believed at the time, but it was different. Well, like, I was a very new Christian. Yeah, but you were doing really well. Like, you were, I mean, you I don't know. You were setting an awesome example is what I'm trying to say. But when I went there and that was part of my everyday and reading about the Bible and stuff, it changed. Mm -hmm. And I just remember walking on campus in the morning, like I was using your GI Bill. 
So I was going for free. And I just remember like being overwhelmed with gratitude. Like everything was going so well. Mm -hmm. I was making like awesome grades. I was on my second semester. And then do you want to tell how the mental breakdown started? (laughs) Well, yeah. Well, you, you you ended up calling me and you had basically stopped your truck in the middle of a major intersection and you couldn't drive anymore because you you thought you were having a heart attack or something and you you called me I, I had to come and get the truck out of the road I can't remember if you called the police or or not but the first that was a, a different well that was when the dogs got in a fight and like pretty much ripped the back of my ear off And I thought I was going to pass out because I thought my ear was infected. Okay. But the time with school, which I think that was a ways before. I think that was my first panic attack, but Mm -hmm. we still didn't know what it was. No, you thought you were having a heart attack or dying. But the one you're talking about, I think I was going over the bridge in Chesapeake heading to school. And I pulled over after the bridge because, yeah, like my vision started getting really small and and black and my heart was racing and I felt like I was gonna I kept feeling like I was gonna pass out it would Mm -hmm. come in waves of nausea and my vision and so I remember sitting on the side of the interstate just cramming this Amy's soup can down my throat because I was like oh my gosh your blood sugar you must be about to like go into a diabetic something and I just I was trying everything to fix it And I was going through like, okay, it's not your blood sugar. You just ate. Maybe it's your heart. And I had called you and said, you need to come pick me up. And you took me to the urgent care. And I remember they did an EKG. They checked my blood sugar. And I remember this really sweet fat woman was like, have you? She was the nurse. She wasn't the doctor. She was like, have you had any major changes in your life lately? And you were like, yeah, she just started back going to school last year or this year. And she was like, oh, sweetie, you're having a panic attack. And I was like offended. I was like, I'm dying. What are you? Mm -hmm. How dare you call that a panic attack? You know? And then that started just this terrible. I think my memories of that period of my life are worse than newly sober. Just because I would just, I was just, cut, I don't know how to even explain it. Five or six major panic attacks a day that would last up to an hour. And it was just, I couldn't breathe. I couldn't see. I couldn't think. I was dizzy. Um, and. You couldn't go to school. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't drive. Yeah. Because my vision would close in on me. And like I would, it would look like I was looking through tubes. And so I wasn't comfortable driving because I was terrified. And my whole life just shut down. Mm -hmm. And I I didn't want you to leave me. I didn't want to be alone because I thought I was going to faint. And I remember you, a couple, you had gone on a hunt. This was a few months into it or a few weeks. I don't know. You had gone on a hunt and I texted you. I said, can you please come home? I don't feel good. And you got home and you were just fed up with it. Like you couldn't live your life because I was over here freaking out and needed you every second of every day. And you said, I, this is a lot like how you were acting when you were on drugs. Mm -hmm. And you thought that I had started using again. Oh yeah. Yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah. And I told, I just remember bawling, crying, just like, I just, it just broke my heart that you thought that and that I couldn't. So I called my therapist that moment and I said, look, my husband thinks I'm using, can we please come up there and do a drug test in your office? Cause I wanted so badly for you to know that that wasn't the case, you know, so mm-hmm. you would be supportive. But yeah, that all, I fought that for probably four or five months before I went back on an SSRI. I wanted so badly to use diet, exercise. I was using a bunch of herbs. Um, I was trying everything I could to avoid 
getting on any medication because I hated it. That was what Mm -hmm. got me in the hole to begin with. But that medication I took, it really did take the edge off enough for me to get back on my feet. Yeah, yeah. I don't think it's solved. No, because it's still something that you you're battling. You know the your the your saving grace is that you you've never given up. Yeah, that's your saving grace is you know of all the temptation that you've had just to end it just to give up. Um, you never have. Uh, you know I would I I would be remiss if I didn't mention my perspective on all of this yeah um from from a, a spiritual viewpoint it's been interesting for me to be a part of your life and your journey uh and you you know whatever pe- people can take this how they will the the spiritual aspect of life and reality and of who and of you is there whether you want to acknowledge it or not it's it's it is a part of who we are and that spiritual realm is there uh you can choose to ignore it but i choose not to ignore it and i can't help but really see the correlation between the this struggle this battle that you fight and how it intensifies has intensified in times where you are getting closer to God in your, in your, you know, your life. So just like at Regent where you're, 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 I think that was the start kind of, of saying, oh man, there may be some correlation here to this. Mm-hmm. We never have made a definitive statement on it. Uh, I mean, how do you? Well, you've been saying that since you said that when I was going there, yeah. that you thought I was under attack. So I think you're fighting, you, you have fought over the years, this battle on two fronts. I think you fought the battle um, that science could could describe to you of the, the um, kind of way drug use messes up the chemicals, chemicals in your brain. And genetics that I was given. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so... You've been fighting that battle on that front, but then you've also been fighting a battle all along on a spiritual front where the the closer you get and as you're understanding and you're seeking, asking and knocking on the realm on the door of that spiritual realm, as that intensifies the the difficulty you experience physically and mentally also intensifies and correlates with that. And so I think it's a, it's a two front thing and you just have never given up, you know? So I think there's a correlation there. I know it's, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know if you can see it or not, but. I mean, logically I can make sense out of, I mean, logically it does make sense because it is the times I've been attacked and the times that I've had other little small really hard times mentally even in the last two three years have been when I feel like I'm seeking God more Mm -hmm. and I think that's a reality a lot of people don't expect when they start to seek God Mm -hmm. like we had two friends that moved from the UK who Chad brought them to Jesus and they took it and hit the ground running and they got hit with some crazy crazy stuff and For me personally, like I've had a lot of weird stuff happen to me since I was a kid. A lot of stuff that you would say is like kind of dark, just strange. And that stuff scares me. Like I don't like talking about it. I don't like watching scary movies, anything with demons or spirits or like I just don't. I just want to pretend it doesn't exist Mm -hmm. because the idea that like that could hurt me like it has freaking terrifies me. Yeah. Yeah. And so that stuff lingers. I mean, it, it is a I, read the freaking the screw tape letters is an amazing example of how, of course, coming from my perspective, a demonic force basically influences you over the course of your life, even after the time that you become a follower of Christ. They still don't give up. No, they still yeah. don't relax on their on their. um 
their that's, tactics. That's when they hit it the hardest, yeah. right? They're, yeah. they're trying to take everything about your life with God and twist it to, to become part of their... Mm-hmm. And so for me personally, I believe that the things that are going on physiologically that are that are a side effect of long-term drug drug use, the things physiologically that are causing these debilitating constant panic attacks and anxiety and things, I believe that that stuff is real, right? But I also believe that stuff is somehow intertwined with the spiritual realm. It's interesting how the the forces that are in play on the spiritual level, they actually have to interact with us physically and mentally through natural processes. I say I say all the time, God is he's the God, yes, of the supernatural, but he works through natural means in the natural world. He created the natural war- world. So something that is outside of of the natural world would be described as like a true miracle, right? Very rarely does that happen. Most of the time, these spiritual forces that are in play in our lives have to have to work through the natural realm. So they are intertwined Mm -hmm. so yeah i mean i just want to put that out there for the listeners i think it's valuable and i think a lot of you guys can relate to that and i think it's over i think it's something that's overstated um in the in the 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 christian conversation is like oh we're under attack we're under attack it's just overstated It, it becomes something that's um uh, that I guess it it loses its its um, intensity because every time something bad happens in life, you just say, "Oh, I'm under attack." Well, that's not always the case. Some bad things happen in life that are a direct result of choices that you've made. Mm-hmm. That's not you being under attack, man. Yeah. Um, some bad things happen in life that are completely out of your control, whether it's sickness or disease or death or or um, whatever. And that's not always you being under attack. When I see the attack is when I see a direct correlation between someone, the difficulty someone is experiencing, uh, it's is synced up with their their mission or or, or them seeking out um, Jesus and and that understanding of of Him and of God. That's where I can identify an attack, you know? Well, and the truth is nobody can identify an attack. We'll never know what's coming from the devil and what's just happen happening because of the way God set up mm-hmm. the world and you know I think there like, are certain red flags, but yeah, I to we can't see it tangibly right. like around us. Right. You can guess. Yeah. But no, I agree. That that derailed my mission when I went to Regent was to become a Christian counselor and to help people who wanted to get sober, get sober. Mm -hmm. And so that just pretty much five, four or five months of insanity completely made me quit school. Mm -hmm. Like I couldn't. So yeah, it derailed the mission. Yeah. It was done. It was over. Yeah. So, you know, but you didn't give up. You may have lost that if you want to look at it from a spiritual realm, if you want to look at it from a physiological realm, you may have lost that battle, but the key is you didn't give up. No. You know? No. I applied for the shipyard right after I left mm-hmm. Regent. Yep. You were bound and determined to, I think, show yourself that, hey, I can freaking be a productive yeah. Human being. I also was so tired of you taking care of me. Like, I was so tired of you making all the money and me. Oh, no, I started. Well, I started at Tractor Supply way before Regent. I started at Tractor Supply like six months sober mm-hmm. and worked my way up to a store manager. Yep. Go me. 
But that was, I mean, that was big for me. It's hard work. Like, I've never, I've People never People at managed. freaking Tractor Supply work hard, man. Oh, they do work really hard. That place hard. is understaffed. I learned that. I, I didn't know corporations work that way. Terrible. But I learned that through your experience. Corporations yeah. will hire, if they need, if they need 10 people to do the job properly, yep. they'll hire six right. and, ex- and expect those six people to do the job that 10 people should be doing. Yep. And it's just a nut roll. It is a nut roll. But yeah, you're right. I did want to prove myself and I did want to want to show that I could be productive. I did have a lot to prove, but I also wanted to help you. Like, I wanted so badly for you to not feel the weight of taking care of me financially, emotionally, physically. Like, I wanted so bad to get to a place where, like, like now I pride myself. And I think I've never put this together, but I'm putting it together right now. I love to be able to say, my friends will go, well, where's Chad? He's off on a hunting trip this weekend. Did, they'll be like, did wasn't he just gone like a few days ago? I'm like, well, yeah, he wanted to go. Well, you're fine with that? Yeah. And like, I've always wanted that. Like I work, I have my own things and you do what makes you happy. And then we come together as a couple. And like, that's what I've always wanted to give you is like, I didn't need you. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like I don't, I don't have to have you. You can have, your own stuff, and you don't feel like you're. I don't think I'm doing a very good job at explaining. No, this. what you what 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 it is is, you're right. We we need each other because we make each other better. When we come in our when we when we are together, and even just being in relationship with one another, we make each other better. That's why we need each other. We don't need each other because we're. We are lacking mm-hmm. or, or, or yes. needing some, Perfect. you know, tangible thing, whether it's money or groceries or a place to live or, or, or a car. Well, for me, a lot of times it was security and I needed you to affirm me and I needed you to help me mentally work through some things and like be like I wasn't able to do that on my own back then. Now I can work through some stuff on my own. Yeah. Like I don't need anybody a lot of times to but I don't know. Man, this is just freaking me out, dude. What? All these people are are sending me this article about these suicide capsules. Are and you I, really going to try to hide no, the podcast? Uh, right no, man. I I'll talk about it on another podcast, but it's just, man, it's just so weird to me that I had that dream and it hit me so hard and I had no clue about this and now these people are sending me this and I'm like man dreams are such a weird thing it's like you you can't always trust them but I don't know I'll have to that's giving me a freaking headache my spirit is heavy right now has been for a little while you know that yeah um anyways we're back go ahead turn no that's make all this about you please that's all that's all i wanted to say Keep i just going. just wanted to let you guys that are listening know i appreciate you listening we got we we actually got an, a new patron during the the episode here. Patreon member? Yeah, we got a new Patreon member during the episode. Nice. Yeah. That was really cool to see that come You want to share their first name? I was going to. You should. Their I, first well, name. I can't. I can't. Well, maybe it's on my email here. Yeah, we got, um. let's see. Justin. Justin is a new Patreon. Thank you, brother. Appreciate that. That was really cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Anyways. So, I feel like I've talked way too much. And... The listeners probably like it. They get probably sick and tired of hearing me. Yeah, you're definitely having some little withdrawals from not talking 
A lot. I can see you over there shifting and just kind of. Oh, whatever. It's abnormal. You're making my job easy. So we went through where we're at right now. Where did we end? Like I had my mental breakdown. I got on the SSRI. That started a whole nother journey outside of sobriety of just trying to get my mental health under control. Mm -hmm. And that is still going today. Like that journey is still not over. I'm still using a ton of herbs and supplements and really leaning into diet, exercise, relationships, sunlight. Um, I mean, you name it. I think we'll be good in our 50s. The crap. (laughs) I'm saying me and you both, I think we'll be real good in our 50s. I'm real good right now. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, Well, uh, I love my life. Well, I do too. It's not easy. And a lot of times I tell Chad, like, I still have panic attacks. I still have a lot of weird mental sensations that come out of nowhere. And I usually will tell him, like, I feel like my brain's attacking me. Because it just is what it feels like. And I haven't figured that out yet. And I will eventually. But you ain't, you are, you don't quit. No. You're a daggone toughie. Thanks, boo. I don't... It's interesting. He's never experienced in any kind of... Like, I know you've experienced trauma and, like, feelings and emotions. But I don't know if you've ever experienced, like, a mental health sensation or, like, a symptom. Like, like a panic attack or... Like, things that come about physically from anxiety. Like, I don't think you've ever experienced anything like that. No, uh, anxiety is not really something that I can understand because I'm just so laid back. Well, I guess you'd have to define what laid back looks like. But in terms of worry, I, I think a lot. I think about, and I struggle with deep things. That's what I was about to say. Like, right now, you just hinted that your heart is heavy. Your heart has been heavy. (laughs) Leonard. Your heart has been heavy because you feel strongly about what's happening. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that not worry? Like, how Mm -hmm. would you categorize that? Well, yeah, it's 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 different than worry, worry or anxiety. Because I more I more struggle with like the burden of finding and implementing a solution, and at every turn when when I see what's happening, well, nationally I can only con- I, I mean I, I'm I, I'm concerned with what's happening happening nationally. I can't be concerned about crap that's going on across the world unless it's affecting us nationally. Um. But when I see the things happening, when you ask why, this was something I really liked and and it resonated with me from uh, what Ted said. He said, stop asking why. Stop trying to apply logic to the, the evil things that you see happening around you. Stop trying to ask why when you see these mandates and all this coronavirus stuff and and how they're trying to keep people from from finding uh natural avenues and solutions to to be healthy and uh stop asking why they they won't advocate for a healthy body uh, through proper diet and exercise if you ask why on these legitimately evil agendas that are causing people pain, suffering, and death. Mm -hmm. It it will give you a headache. It will drive you insane if you try to figure out the why. Yeah. And I think a lot of times maybe I ask why too much, and maybe that's why I feel so heavy instead of saying, you know what, I can't ask why in the face of evil. I just have to say, this is freaking evil, and 
here's what needs to be done to uh to counterpunch it, you know? Yeah. So that it's different. Yeah, you know, I'm not worried about evil. It is part of the all we can do is push push it back. But it's always gonna be here. I can't I I, I don't worry about it. Um but it does frustrate me. Yeah. So a little different. Yeah, it is. It's definitely different. Well, I well mean, yeah, you got through your um dude. Hmm. You how about your shipyard days? That I was love, a that was a heck of a job right there, son. I loved my shipyard days. I applied soon after Regent. I was still going through all the panic attack stuff, but I knew I wanted to work. So I applied for an apprenticeship program to be a pipe fitter for the Navy as a civilian. And I went into a program working on nuclear submarines. And I freaking loved it. Like, you worked some terrible hours, though. I did. I, we were an hour from my work. And I would wake up at 4 a.m. And I would get home a lot of times at 4 p.m. And, like... I don't know if y'all have ever been on the coast of Virginia, but in the summer, it gets so freaking hot and humid. You will feel like you're dying. Like I think it does kill you. It was it was the, the heat. We used to have these things called black flag conditions, and uh, it was like not suitable to be outside for more than ten minutes at a time without coming in. My boss, we used to do we used to do oil on loads on and off the submarines in the dry dock. And that would involve someone standing at the truck and monitoring all the connections because you're right by the ocean. So if you spill oil, it's going to go in the water. So it was a really big deal to make sure that all our connections were good and throughout the whole onload, whatever, really boring stuff. You had to stand out on black asphalt beside a huge black submarine in a dry dock. And it was like 102 just... And I just remember, like, on those weeks that we had that, by Wednesday, I would get home and just sleep. You remember that? Oh, man. Like, I wouldn't even, I couldn't even eat. I would just, like, but it was such a fun job. I don't think I would have lived very long just being around all the welding and the gases and just, I mean, honestly, radiation. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't think that my health would have been as good. Um as it is and, and can be when I get older, if I had have made a career out of that. No. Like you s- liked the camaraderie and oh the jokes. Gosh. and Man, it was me and 16 dudes. And, like, once we got past the point of, like, them understanding that I would never flirt or, like, be, like, their work girlfriend, like, I was not that type of person, if we were all buddies. And, like, if you... you you probably don't know me very well if you're listening to this, but, like, I'm a dude. Well, you like hanging out with guys. Yeah. And I like hanging out with girls. Yeah. But the difference is I like hanging out with dudes because my humor, a lot of the times the things I like, the things I like to talk about, the things I enjoy, we all have in common. You like hanging out with women because you think they're pretty. No, I don't. You I don't like have... hanging out with women because they are freaking no bull crap. They're, that is not all women. I think, well, the, the 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 females that I like to be around, I like to be around them because they're freaking tough. They're no bull crap. There's no ego. That's true. No ego. Well, again, this is, this is the women that you are around. That's not all of them, but yes. Yeah. Compared to men, less ego. Yeah, a hundred percent. That that's what I mean, that's what I that's why I'm the way I am. I'm just so over freaking ego and and tough and muscles and all this stuff, man. And so yeah, anyways. Yeah, you like being able to just be vulgar. Mm-hmm. Exactly. <laughs> Absolutely vulgar. I used to play pranks on the regular there. 
Like, I would bring my fart spray, my fart machine. Oh, my gosh. I had a bunch of, like, there was a couple dudes in there that were terrified of spiders. So, I bought those little prank fluffy spiders. Oh, yeah. And uh, I used to wreak havoc in there. And you genuinely like to work hard, too. I do like physical work. Yeah. I like being exhausted. Those Even those oil onload days, like, just the end of the day, like... Your body hurts. You you can't stop yawning. All you can think about is laying down in bed. Like, that makes me happy. Mm-hmm. I don't like what it did to my body, but I do enjoy working hard physically. Mm-hmm. And I like working with a team. Like, I just, I, I liked that job. Like, I could have, I would have worked really hard, but I could have worked there and been, like, a happy person. Mm-hmm. You didn't like the stupid government bureaucracy. No. The good old boys club? Yeah. Yeah. The the fact that people could just, once they got a foot in the door there, it was like almost impossible to fire them. Yeah, there were some turds. Like, well, that's federal government for you. Every single branch of the federal government is swollen to the brim. (laughs) That Okay. I said corporations hire six people to do a job that requires 10 people. Yep. The federal government hires 100 people to do the job that requires five people. Yep. And they just go ahead and set that standard that you're going to do the workload of .0.12 of a person. Yeah. That's all all you're responsible for. Your work ethic actually got you, I don't want to say in trouble, but people didn't like your work ethic there. No, they said that I was trying to make them look bad and trying to take over things. Yeah, yeah, I got in a lot of, it had a lot of issues with people because I wanted to get things done. Mm-hmm. Yeah, especially being a female, which I, I loved it the whole time. Like, um, you're not going to hear me complain about it, but it's a reality that, When you come into a situation with 16 men and you, and you want to take the lead on something or you want to push, you're going to get pushed back, you know, especially a lot of older guys in there that have been there for 20 years and they just don't, they're old school. They don't think women should be working Mm -hmm. in those positions, you know? Yeah. I, I, I'm glad you didn't stay. I'm glad you didn't stay there. I, I don't think that was the job for you, but I think it provided a great opportunity for you to go into something that was hard. It was hard to get into. It mm-hmm. took months and months, and you had to go through the the whole process. and Security clearance. Yeah, I mean, and- the applications and, and this and all, and you're learning new stuff. And so I think that really gave you confidence and, and hit the spot that you were looking for. Like, okay. I can do. I that. can do something that's yeah, well, that's legit. Because I was making good money, and like if I had a stuck with it, I would have made really good money by by the UPS guys here. Oh great! He, ha- he had to honk the horn too, huh? Hey, hush. No, but yeah, I would have made good money by society standards. Yeah. Oh yeah. So yeah, I I think that's a good point. To stop, what what were you about to say? Well, in in all this, and and where where we'll end it off, um, oh my gosh, well no, I guess we should end it right there because I was gonna say I was gonna jump to the fact that in all this we had bought a new property out in rural Virginia in yep. Suffolk and um developed it and put a house on it and all this and we were just. We just said, okay, this is where we're going to be. Live for forever. This is where we're going to be. Yeah. You were were on shore duty at the time. Well, yeah. And and shortly thereafter was when I started the whole medical retirement process, which is a freaking, was just a nightmare. Yeah. Um, Or, or, I mean, what's going to be coming up is that, and then you convincing me to move back yeah okay. yeah so yeah not right now is probably a good time to end people don't like to listen to barking dogs on a podcast <laughs> <laughs> well 
Well, well, thanks for listening, guys. If you enjoyed it, <clears throat> give it a share. <clears throat> like I said earlier, and uh, probably sometime within the next six months, we'll pick up on the uh, <laughs> next part Ju- of June of 2022. <laughs> yeah, we'll pick up on the next part of our journey in life. Leonard, so shut up. Love you guys. Thanks for listening. Thanks, said. y'all.